wherever you are, close your eyes. Unless you're driving or flying a plane, then absolutely don't close your eyes. Or if you're cycling, don't do that. Actually, keep keep your eyes open. Yeah. And think, with with your eyes open, about winning. Feels pretty great, doesn't it? And now you can do it anywhere with the National Lottery app. <laughs> Download the National Lottery app today. Play anywhere, win anywhere. G'day, and welcome to the very quick fire game show. What are all these ducks doing lying around? <laughs> yes, Alan. Is the answer that they've eaten too much stale cake? No, Alan, you're wrong. You're wronger than a man who's just removed all his trousers and wandered casually into a cactus emporium. <laughs> Alan Famili Milly Milly Chope hails from Canberra, owns a lice farm, punches dingoes in a dingo punching circus, and once sneezed near someone who he thought was Owen Wilson at an all you can grill topless boat party. You're listening to What Are All These Ducks Doing Lying Around? And we're still looking for a possible answer to What Are All These Ducks Doing Lying Around? <coughs> yes, Ted. Is the answer they're tired after a particularly heavy cricket game? <laughs> no, nope, that's still not the answer. And it looks like we're running out of time. And so we'll have to wait till next week to find out just what are all these ducks doing lying around. Wait just one ballet moment. I'm Gerald Hibiscus Coat Made of Otters. Gasp! Gasp. Gerald, Gerald Hibiscus Coat Made of Otters. And I'm interrupting this show to make a very important announcement. They're selling half-price corked hats at the local 8 till late shop. We already know that, Gerald. I bought three today. All right, then. I'll sod off. Please do. The ducks are all lying around because I poison them because I hate ducks and much prefer the majestic Canadian goose. Wait, what did you say? I said the ducks are all lying around because I poisoned them because I hate ducks and I much prefer the majestic Canadian goose. And that is the right answer. <laughs> Goebbels, tell him what he's won. Well, Pat, he's won 14 herring-shaped fridge adornments, a can of industrial cabbage grease, and several knitted effigies of Geoffrey Palmer, the well-respected English actor with the jowls. Globes and globes of mouldy salad dressing in a hat. The album What's All This Then by Fati Bantam and the Biggles Teeth. A pair of soiled Dutch trousers donated by famous Amsterdam artist Splurge Nijurgen. Lily Frung's book Poetry for the Elderly. A severed badger face nailed to a twig. A signed Barry Humphreys. Fern Britain's glazed spleen. The bags belonging to a dwarf wizard child named Pip. I really am very sorry. And now, as if I couldn't be sorrier than what I already was, it's the After Movie Diner. You're listening to the After Movie Diner with your host, John Cross. And now, here's your host, John Cross. Hello, I'm Eric Basil Sweat. No, wait a minute. No, I'm not. I'm John Cross. And I'm just doing this little message before we get on with all the madness. Uh, just to uh, plead to everyone out there. Well, not plead. Well, ask. Well, beg. Well, get on all fours and bark around like a small animal. Uh, just to say, please do contact us. And contact us using email, hello at aftermoviediner.com. That's hello at aftermoviediner.com. Telephone number 347-669-0053. That's 347-669-0053. Or you can go over to speakpipe.com forward slash aftermoviediner. Or go over to aftermoviediner.com and fill out the contact form on the website. You'd think with all these ways to contact us, we'd be being contacted all the time because people just would not stop. We've also got Facebook. That's uh, facebook.com forward slash aftermoviediner. There's Twitter. 
at After Movie Diner. Basically, wherever After Movie Diner is, that's where we are. So why not contact us, you bastards? And now to Brooklyn and a rather famous diner. I'll stop that. Hello and welcome to this week's After Movie Diner. And here we are in Junior's. The, uh, Why are you saying it like that? Because uh, from uh, Last Crusade. Junior! Like Sean That's Connery. the worst Sean Connery. I mean, Sean Connery's one of the easiest impressions in the world. Well, you do it then. Go Junior's. <laughs> but it's just not a Sean Connery word. Oh, shut up, whatever. All he right. says it in fucking... Uh, my point is you go, Junior's! There he goes, he goes, Junior! Like that. <laughs> like all the way through... The last right, crusade, right, he does right. that. The more you practice it, the slightly better it gets. Anyway, we're here in Brooklyn, uh, in f- famous diner, where famous we diner. did the uh, uh, oh, fourth doing? anniversary here, did where we? we went to see something at BAM, that one with Chris Christopherson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not Chris Christopherson. Yeah, Chris Christopherson was in it. Was he? Yeah, he was the main dude in it. It was all those set in Seattle. And he no, walked, I remember that. It was like a kind of beatnik. Oh, movie. I do remember every year right, it was. It was but anyway, here we are in Junior's. Better. Junior's. I should have been a bit lower, lower <laughs> down. <laughs> Junior's. Junior's. <laughs> I don't, should have mailed it to the Marx Brothers. Should have mailed um, it to the Marx So we're here in Junior's and we have just been that to we've the Alamo Drive. Junior's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to get tired of saying that. Right. And uh, we're here, uh, we just went to the Alamo Draft House uh, to watch a movie. And uh, my wonderful, splendid, uh, thigh bendingly, uh, awesomely, uh, shavedly headedly guy, uh, co host, man, gentle thing, who's with me. Oh, my goodness, they have to turn the heat up, haven't they? <laughs> oh, I'll take my jacket off now. Uh, anyway, you know who he is. Your friend and mine, everyone's favourite clown, it's Jim Wallace. <laughs> Nobody's ever described me as everybody's favourite clown before. Thank you very much for having me. And I feel, considering the movie we're doing, I should have shaved off my beard, shaved off my hair, and be like wearing a slightly uh, skinny hoodie, and just to unnerve you. Oh, I see. I totally didn't. No, I thought you were going no, down the no, 90s no. route. Yeah. No, well, that as well. Yeah. That as well. But we're both men of the 90s. Oh, we are. Oh, wow. Look at this. Beets and Beets, onions. Pickles, cold floor. Pickles, cold floor. Lovely. You are Thank never you short much. of anything here at Junior's. <laughs> But yeah, uh, so what was the movie we saw? We saw uh, Single White Female. Single White Female. Part of the Jennifer Jason Lee Festival. Part of the <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was a festival. <laughs> I think they need to change it. Like, festival suggests celebration of some kind. She should and be I, celebrated. She's very good. She should be celebrated, but I feel that her movies in general are not celebratory affairs. They're more kind of how Actually, miserable. Actually, that's quite weird because I was thinking when well, I said to Theresa... Like, a lot of her movies are pretty dark. The thing, well, pretty dark. The thing is, I was thinking Junior's. about, about <laughs> Jennifer Jason Lee. You were thinking about... And I was thinking, thinking I really liked her. In a dirty Lee. way. She's always, okay, she's always really good. And yeah. I started to think about the movies I've seen her in. Yeah. And I thought, was she really I good? I can't think of any. No, no, any like big famous ones. I know well, that they're a big fan. Okay. I mean, like as so, in, a, oh, she was in. Like I was going, oh well, I love her in Existence, but like. Right. So no, her movies. I would say she is. She is. The prime actress for back when there was, or there were rather, sort of the middle class movies, meaning the 20 to 70 million dollar budgeted, they're not big blockbusters, they're not your little indies, although she has done some indies as well. She's more your, like you say, like exercise, like back when Cronenberg was making movies, or back when like the, the Coen brothers were starting out, whatever. Like she's your. She's your like poster you know child I mean? for like, that. She no no. She's not in a... big, but Cronenberg did big movies and Cohen Brothers did. But I mean, there's like big successful movies. I can't think of like a defining you know role for her. You know what I mean? Like if Kathy Bates is Misery, say for example. Right right right. Or I don't know. Um, well, she's done. Okay, so she's. I mean, I would say her defining role is single white female. Really? Yeah. Or uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn. 
Because okay, neither of us have ever seen that. No, I, I remember seeing the video cover though and thinking, oh, look, Jennifer Jason Lee in another miserable film about miserable people probably yeah, being that's not really a defining miserable. movie, though, is it? Uh, no, but she's in a lot of classics now. Like, The Hitcher is now a classic. Yeah, but uh, first okay, time so at Ridgemont High. When I was trying to think of a I know movie what you mean. I know what like, you mean. I know what you mean. I do know what you mean. You know, she's in, yeah. and then, meh. Uh, so, anyway, that's why we went and saw <laughs> We're now perusing the menu, I guess, right? Well, I'm looking at it. Okay, so I've got a question. Yeah, okay. uh, well, sorry, I, I, uh, we'll probably need we're, one more minute. Yeah, we're, we're sorry. sorry. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. What, 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 are, what are griddle cakes, exactly? Griddle cakes? Griddle cakes. Where are they? Under breakfast all day. <laughs> I'm assuming it's like a pancake-y thing, is it? Griddle cake? Where do you see that? Down the bottom. Griddle cake. The bacon with sausage. I feel like it, it seems like it might be kind of a pancake thing, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Why don't you just pick something you know what it is? Because I, I like the sound of griddle cakes. What's wrong with that? Why am I enemy of the people? For You're not enemy of the people. <laughs> it's just you have to go into this whole big thing. Ask the gentleman when he comes back over, excuse me, squire, what are griddle cakes? Oh, assume okay. that they're pancakes <laughs> and move on. <laughs> all right, then, all right. I'm just going to do ham, egg and chips, which is pretty average for me, but there we go. <laughs> Um, they're burgers, I can say if you're going to have a burger, they burger. are pretty big burger. and dense. Burger. I found them a bit heavy. Burger the Jewish! Last time I had a burger when I was there. Alright, I'll probably just get the burger anyway. I think I'm going to go for the griddle cakes. Ooh, they do a chicken sausage. Sausage. parmigiana. <laughs> yes, I'm going with the griddle cakes. Excellent. I'm not even going to ask what they are. Griddle cakes with turkey sausage. Chicken on a bun. What mad, what madness is this? Chicken on a bun, you say? What mad fool no, it's just, it's just... put it on a menu? <laughs> wait, what happened to Junius? Um, you mean, that, wait a minute, let me understand this, Jeffrey. They, they put the bun a, on the chicken, They took right? a chicken and a bun, and they put chicken on a bun? Ridiculous. You're fired. Have you ever... <laughs> Get, Get out, out of my office. I've had enough of your chicken and bun. <laughs> so now we have Get out of the very small restaurant office. Yeah. Restaurant offices. Are always very small. What, what are we looking at? Files. I'm reminiscing about small restaurant offices. And the good listeners to the After Movie Diner are pressing pause yeah. <laughs> and thinking should we bother should, should we bother, bother going on with this let's not bother are they gonna are they gonna talk about single white female at any point no yes we no. are yes we will uh, um yeah so i know what you're saying uh she's not known for like one particular stand-up role i think she's known for many she's known as like she's a a, a, a strongly Absolutely. regarded actress yeah yeah, yeah. go ahead uh, can I get the griddle cakes with the turkey sausage? Lovely. And a cup of chamomile tea. Thank you. Uh, I will have uh, two eggs over easy. Uh, can I get that with the Virginia ham, please? And sure. French fries. Yes, uh, come to the fries. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, okay, well, so yeah, so, is. So, this is an odd thing. I started to think about, and all I could think of was. Well, like, I would say, I would say, movie. I would say, no, no, but I, but that's not true. You can't see obscure. The Hitcher is not an obscure movie. Well, no, but it's a, it's a okay. single white female. It's not an obscure movie. But Fast I've Times never, okay. at Richmond High is not an obscure movie. But I've never seen Dorothy Fast Parker in the Circle of but Whatever. I've never seen any of these. No, no, I know Dorothy Parker in the Vicious obscure, Circle. But I'm saying that's not, that's fairly it. obscure. It wasn't back in the VHS days because I remember seeing the trailer for it ad nauseum. But that's fairly obscure. But like Hudsucker Proxy, that's kind of obscure. But like at least movie fans know what it is. Yeah, no, I mean I'm not saying she doesn't have an impressive body of work. I'm just saying. It no, was I know what odd to me while I was thinking of her, but I couldn't think of a single like, oh, that's who Jennifer Jason is. But you her. don't think the single white it's, female is her defining? Well, because I've like, never if seen her. If, some, if someone had said to me before today, right. who's Jennifer Jason Lee? Like, oh, who's Jennifer Jason Lee again? I go, um, 
Really? Uh, all right. Well, but that's what happened. I couldn't think of a movie. See, I really, really the... like her, and I've seen all these movies. I just couldn't. Back in the day, I was a bit. All of I could think of was I was uh, a bit with Jason. Lee. And what's the Christian Bale one where he's? Really I didn't there. even think of Exorcist. Yeah. Machinist. That's what I thought. Machinist. Right. And right. Now, 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 this, this, this explains. This, but this shows what I mean. At a certain point in the '90s and probably the early 2000s, because I'm not entirely sure when all these movies came out. But in because I think Exorcist is, is late '90s. Sorry. Right. Okay. So in the 90s, let's just say the 90s. The 90s. Because I think this, the 90s. this podcast Let's say the 90s. Is, let's say the 90s. <laughs> let's okay. say it one more time and then let's move, say the 90s. move it on. And then we're just going to move on. The 90s. Well, then we'll never say it again. Uh, welcome back. We're still saying <laughs> the 90s. Um, <laughs> welcome back. And they're still playing snooker. Um, so in the 90s, I think... <laughs> <laughs> juniors <laughs> uh, in the 90s juniors uh, juniors 90s uh, no, you're just freestyling again, shit, no I am no, no. spinning your wheels uh, no mate. I'm not spinning reset no I, I'm stuck in a rut I'm right. stuck in a rut I'm stuck in a rut juniors so I think she was able to, she was in and the, not the face of but certainly I think maybe the name of or something those uh not exactly low budget or indie, but those studio movies that weren't like uh, your big blockbusters. A bit, uh, a bit she was, beat. Right. She was never in a Jurassic Park, let's say, or whatever. Right, right, right. right. But she was, or, or uh, what were the other big blockbusters in the 90s? Independence Day? Right, 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 right. She's not, she's not going to show up in that. She's not quirky enough to show up in one of them, like a Sam Neill or a, a Jeff Goldblum or whatever. Right, right. Um, but she's not, uh, she's certainly well known enough that she's in movies made by studios, right? Right. Um, so, at a certain point, however, when those movies dry up, because you don't, like one of the things we'll talk about, presumably, is those 90s home invasion thrillers or 90s thrillers in general that you just don't really get anymore. Like, they just don't really make those films anymore. No, probably so. There's the odd one. There was that one with uh, Samuel L. Jackson living next door to Patrick Wilson at the end of a cul-de-sac and they were kind of like, there was a lot of racial tension. and That was more of a 2000s thing. But that's what I'm saying. They do make them occasionally, but right, they, okay. they, they're, they're not the raison. Right, they're not the said, thing yeah. they were making... They're yeah, not, no, no, yeah, uh, there, was they, the, there was a whole rash of them at a certain point. Yeah, like, when he even Goldie yeah. Horn did one. Yeah. She did Deceived. Yeah. Do you remember that one? No. Where it was like, I married a man, but I don't really know who he is. And it oh, turns was, out he's a spy or something. Well, I guess they were kind of like almost... There was a paranoia of your neighbour. Well, this, this one was quite... I, this one was quite Hitchcocky, I thought. Right. Like the music was quite Hitchcocky. The whole like doubling thing. Right. Was that, was that a clip from Vertigo on the TV in the movie? I feel like it. I think that might have been. It was might definitely have been. Jimmy Stewart. That's, yeah. Uh, it might have been Vertigo. Come off me, yes. Thank you very much. Lovely. Look at that. Hot water in the bag. Thank you. Sorry. Perfect. No, but like, so that's what I'm saying. You know, it's Earl Grey, dude. That says Earl Grey on oh, the front. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna have Earl Grey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be crazy and I'm going to have Earl Grey because I've served it properly so it's actually got a chance of tasting good. But he's not going to bring milk and sugar though, is he? Well, I don't take it with sugar and I'll ask. Okay. So anyway, that's what I'm trying to... So let me finish my thought. So she was a bit of the darling of the, I would say, uh, middle-range budgeted film. But quirky. In the 90s. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say she was quirky. I would say some of the films she was in certainly were. She's kind of a quirky figure. No. Uh, I guess so. I mean, she... I don't know. That's like a proxy, Dorothy Parker, like that one. Right, I think she has range. I don't necessarily see her as a quirky figure. Yeah. Anyway, no, post, so. post those movies, you do see her like The Machinist, like Greenberg, like a couple of the others. You see her showing up more in what is considered indie fare. Like, if it's a Fox Searchlight movie, she's probably in it. Well, there's probably you know more, I mean? but also I think there's, there are these... So days, instead of making the leap... More interesting parts for older women. I get it. But what I'm saying is, instead of making the leap to being in, like, a, a blockbuster movie, like, um... The lady from Homicide who won the Oscar and said fuck oh, Melissa, the Oscar. Leo. Melissa Leo shows up randomly in Olympus Has Fallen, for example. Yeah, good point. Right. She's a bit awful in it. But Laura does... Dern in Jurassic Park? Laura Dern in Jurassic Park. I'm saying there are older ladies who aren't Meryl Streep who have gone on to do 
blockbustery things. Meryl Streep can still get a mid-range yes, budget movie greenlit, you, right? Uh, Julia Roberts can still get a mid-range budget movie she's greenlit. Kind of a, um, but Jennifer Jason Lee, she's not going to be able to walk into the studio and be like, <clears throat> I would like 60 minutes to Johnny make Depp, my... Do you remember how Johnny Depp used to be before he went mad? Yes. When he would only do like interesting, quirky movies right. that he thought were worthwhile. Yes. Well. She was sort she of... seems to do like that kind of a thing. Right. 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 I mean, to do this... Okay, take this movie, for example, right? To do this movie, if you're like an up-and-coming Hollywood actress, man, right. like... I mean, she's not up-and-coming at this point. But she's still, like, she's getting going, right? Well, she's been in a couple of big things by this point. But it's... A couple it's of a, big rentals. There's a commendable... Can I get some milk? Sorry. Sorry? Some milk. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Who's going to have enough? Uh, milk. Thanks. Um... Uh, yeah, there's a commendable like lack of ego in like taking this this part. I mean, it's a real like you know, it's one to get your teeth into. Yeah, I mean, plus she's acting opposite a paper bag in red hair, aka Bridget Fonda. Right. So it's easy to you know. Is that how you see her, Bridget Fonda? Well, she's not very good, is she? Right. I have to say, and I I have to. I don't think anyone's particularly like great. Yes, Jennifer, in this movie. I think yes, she, I think yes, Jennifer Jason Lee like gets to be, you know, slightly creepy and slightly quirky and twitchy I and kind of very sympathetic. Really? Yeah, I felt very sorry for her. When? When she killed the dog? When she beat no, the gay not. guy over the head with a big well, stick? Well, no, but the gay guy, she wasn't my. Like... I don't know. know. I just, I, I yes. Okay. He was saying, I, but that's the point. You're not it? in like, danger. Don't if, worry. We just want to help you. Puppy, and she, right? right. If she un, thank you very much. And if she like she removed would, a, an iron pipe from a gay man's head, then it would be easy to feel sympathy for her. Right. I'm saying you felt sympathy for her just because she wasn't Bridget Fonda, and apparently, no, from your no. non-Bridget Fonda status, no, I, no, I'm not you saying, like, don't I'm think you like Fonda. I'm not Bridget. You are, you are you are a Fonderist of the highest <laughs> order. Uh, I'm just saying. I did I catch him. I don't think it's controversial. Burning copies of. Um, <laughs> What is Bridget Fonda World well, Best Known for? What's that, um, the professional rip-off she did that's a remake of the Femme, La Femme Nikita? Oh, no, no point Nikita, of return. No, no point of, point of no return. I thought it was called Nikita. No, it was called Point the of No Return. The Assassin, it's called The Assassin. Uh, in England, maybe over here, it was called Point of No Return. All right, fair enough. Uh, anyway. Uh, she was rubbish in that. I've caught she you burning copies. Of, well, she just really did. No, rubbish. She, she didn't really, like, get the movie. To be like, well, it's a simple plan, I guess. She's all right now. I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying she's bad or anything. I'm just saying this is a two hander, right? Right. And uh, she doesn't get a lot to do except be a bit of an right, uppity 90s yuppie bitch. Right. Really. But she's, I'm just saying she's not great. Whereas I thought Jennifer Jason Lee was great. I thought she she managed to make what could have been an over the top, um, you know, like oh, I'm I'm crazy, watch out for me, you know, performance <laughs> into something that had nuance and sympathy. True. Yes. You know, when when she was when she was hurt by people, when people did things like I don't know, um, called her crazy, or uh, I don't know, they were just I'm trying to think now, but there were moments in the movie where people did things that were painful to her, and and you really and you felt it. You know, it wasn't like you didn't feel it like oh she's going to go crazy now, but like I, I felt. It. And I think the goal... Even, even though she was a mass-murdering psychopath. She wasn't a mass-murdering. Like, the first... Well... She didn't kill the game. Though. She thought she had. Right. But it wasn't, like... If she'd been... You know, it would have been one of those ones where, like, you know, the shots they love in Hollywood where they keep beating with them with right. quite long after the eating. He only right. hit her with it a couple of times and oh, dumped well. him in a bath. Oh, that well, that's that. all right. Then. Only well, hit him a few granted, times. So he had a granted, massively... she wasn't super, you know, right. careful about what right. she did with the iron pipe. I'm just saying she didn't actually kill him. Then she went and, and raped the second one the was... Fiance. Uh, the second one was... Um, Mouth accident. rape. It was an accident. It's not an accident. It is an accident. She threw a shoe at him. No, she didn't. She picked up a oh, stiletto. Oh, she hit him with a shoe. She, no, no. She didn't hit him with Normally, a shoe. Normally, she I'm picked up with a stiletto. Times out of ten. She picked up a stiletto, spun it around in her hand so that it was facing that way, and she swung it into his face. She hit him with a shoe like that. She swung. And she meant it. to cause him damage, no doubt. But the fact that the stiletto went through his eyeball right. into his brain and killed him stone dead. 
Because I feel the luck of the draw and more than And then she started to like, stroke him with her foot going, hello, hello. Yeah, because she, she wasn't, he wasn't no, dead, that's my point. No, I think, you've, I think you've underestimated the insanity of the I know, day. I know. I'm not saying that she's not insane. I'm not going, oh, she was all right, I'd let her off. And, and have her this week's tea. after movie, I know, Jim Wallace sides with psychopaths. <laughs> God, it's, so. like, it's like eating, it's like drinking tea with a daily man. <laughs> There's no nuance. I'm just saying. Right, no, I get it. I do understand. I, thought, I do understand. Yeah. What was nice about the movie you are Sean, it wasn't just... You are Sean Spicer trying to explain. <laughs> Listen, I understand what I am the Sean did. Spicer of the after movie. You are. I am and the... you can put that <laughs> on my fucking Don't whatever. tap because then people will hear it. Sorry. Uh, I'm but very spicer of me. There was spicer with tap. Spicer with tap. Sean, yeah. Sean, Sean. We take can't a hear deep you breath. in your tap, mate. Stop tapping. Speak into the mic, don't tap it. Uh, no, I get. No, I do understand what you're saying, and I'm. I'm just thinking it could have been. Could have been a bit. And what what I liked about it, right. right? I felt that it was. I felt that it was a little drawn out. Agree. Um, because by the time you're like, oh, okay. First of all, okay. So let's step back a bit. Should, should I do the plot? You want to do the plot? Let's step back. A bit. It, okay, fine. Do the plot. What such as it is. <laughs> do the plot. All right, fine. Bridget Fonda, because I, I liked how quickly. Anyway, Bridget Fonda, bird in New York, uh, newly arrived. Um, wants to get married to a boyfriend, finds out that a boyfriend's cheated on her, kicks him out, gets a roommate, who is Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh, they bond, but then she makes up with boyfriend. Um, Jennifer Jason Lee doesn't like this, and slowly her obses- obsession and obsessive need for companionship, specifically with Bridget Fonda, uh, drives her to murderous acts. That's pretty good, right? You missed a major part of it. Which part? Uh, well, the fact that she's not just doing it for companionship, she's doing it because of uh, uh, deep guilt over her twin. Yeah, I felt like that was... But the, what interested me about the movie, right, right. what I liked about it was... Was something that the, the writer Fonda, didn't intend and you've just made up. Yeah, all right, fine. Yeah, but it's perfectly possible. That's Almost fine. certainly true. Yeah. Is that us? No. no. Um, I'm saying that, yes... <clears throat> In the standard of 90s thrillers, like they like to do. Yeah. Like to do you go, well, I've got to have a reason, haven't they? They've got to have like a trauma in their past that means they like to wear hats and kill people. <laughs> you know what I mean? What I liked about the 70s the was like, killer. there's no explanation. He right. just put on a hat and he killed people. He that killed people. Right. And you're looking for an explanation, tough. And there at the end one. of it, you found a and slightly the natty trauma. We found a hat in his childhood <laughs> home with a knife in it. Anyway. All right. Yeah, all, all that stuff doesn't really explain. It seemed to me that the, the powerful moments between Jennifer Jason Lee and Bridget Fonda were all when Jennifer Jason Lee wishes she was like Bridget Fonda because Bridget Fonda has everything. She's like, she's beautiful, she's stylish, she's got her own business, she's got a bloke who's like calling up on her and going, oh, you must get back with me because you're so great. She's, she's like, got oh, the mo- I don't need you. She's got the most ridiculously amazing New York apartment that is, of course, rent control. It is, it is. Could we just talk briefly about the thing that was, I think, the most 90s thing about the movie? Oh, go right ahead. What, apart from Bridget Fonda's hairstyle? No, apart from Bridget Fonda's hairstyle. Was just, is I sit there going, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think there did used to be this many tits in movies. They were everywhere. The whole film was, like, covered in tits. No, it I... It was like a tit analogue. <laughs> Right? Every it was, time. It, it was, was like, a it was tits, 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 tits. it was a it was a mammary explosion. I honestly think But I think nineties movies used to be like that. No, I mean uh, you used to have a lot of tits. Yes and no. You hardly okay. ever get tits over. Alright, so so there are two things. I'm not saying this is a good thing or I'm a saying. bad thing. There are two things that play into this. Are the tits? <laughs> into the tits. Is it a left tit and a right tit? No, no, tit? we've got a lot of tits. Is it a pair of tits? We've got a lot to a pack here. <laughs> Lot to there are two things. Okay, to first of all, about. first of all, and they're both warm and lovely. First of, <laughs> they're both pink. Uh, in this case, and they both have nipples on the end. They both have nipples on the end. The nipples of truth. They are the, the two things that you want to talk about. Yeah, a warm, the nipples of mother hope and are slowly and, running and, and dry. Uh, nipples of hope. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. Nipples. 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 <laughs> nipples. Watches is what we sell. Nipples. Nipples. Um, that is a reference to a Scandinavian sketch <laughs> no one's ever heard of, except John, me, and you. So yet again, I'm bringing up cultural touchstones yeah. that everyone can get behind. Okay, so I think to maximise the potential of marketing this movie, mm-hmm. to use an excessively wanky phrase, mm-hmm. but it does set up what I'm trying to talk about. On one hand, you've got the uh, invasion thrillers, home invasion thrillers of the 90s, and you've got the, I accidentally married a psychopath movies, or whatever it is, or the, my husband's really a spy. 
movies, whatever it is. Right. Um, but on the other flip side, there was, of course, the erotic thrillers of the day, your basic instincts, your fatal attractions, your slippers, that kind of movie. Yeah. And I think that one aspect of it, I'm going to talk about the second aspect in a minute, but one aspect of it was to this is try and cross-market this. Okay, yeah. As possibly an erotic thriller, so that in the trailer you can have, like, glimpses of whatever, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. The second thing is, is although it's definitely uh, uh, plays out as a 90s uh, uh, thriller with erotic elements, um, there is a slight art housey feel to the movie and a slight um, really? no there is the way it's shot the way it's lit but I thought that it was the way like, it's, hang on a second the, like that. but I'll shut up th- there is that aspect as well but in the fact that it is a two-hander between two women predominantly um, there is a certain I felt with, especially with the endless walking from the bathroom to my bedroom scenes or the endless oh I just woke up and this is what I'm wearing scenes rather than finding a necessarily um, uh, erotic titillating titillating, good word good word there's at least one tit in that word (laughs) possibly two possibly two tit tit titillating no it's only really one Uh, what if you say titillating there's two in there titillating to titillating um, uh, that rather than finding it that way it 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 rang a little bit more truthful in the way that two women would well see yeah that's um, what I was wondering about the whole thing when would the... live together and that's where I mean I don't necessarily mean our house I mean kind of there is a sort of feminist undertone there is like you could get very wanky about this movie and dissect it in a in a, uh, a strokey beard feminist type way well, there you are, can leave that to me mate they're right exactly <laughs> there are like questions of feminine identity and uh, uh, sexual ambiguity and various other things that are going on in the film in the subtext and the nudity in some way and, and certainly the actors uh, uh, relaxed naturalistic nudity because there isn't a lot of like there is a couple of sex scenes, but there isn't a lot of like, while there's a sex scene, her breasts are glistening and bouncing and whatever. Yeah, like, there's not a lot of that. The nudity comes from uh, recognizable human nudity. So I am walking to the bathroom or I am changing my nightgown into my whatever. I am trying, like, it just seemed to me it helped speak to the relationship between the two women. The fact that uh, from the get go, Jennifer Jason Lee was perfectly comfortable. Uh, being naked around Bridget Fonda, but Bridget Fonda always found it uncomfortable. Right. Um, that spoke to something, and yet felt comfortable in her own uh, nudity more often than not. But so there, there was a lot of interesting things going on there that I felt that the nudity played into that was more than just let's market this as a tip fest. That's not, well, what I was wondering is that was very. Elo- I think that's the most eloquent you've ever spoken about on tips. the diner, and it was about tips. I yeah. just want you to know that. I, I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I can be eloquent from yeah, time to time. But only when it's about tits. Um, what, what I wondered, basically, was whether there's not an element of it, and I agree with everything you're saying, by the way, but if there's not an element of it, it's a bit like, this is what blokes think um, like women get up to if, when they live together. They just wander around all the time in the bath. And sooner or later, they try and kill each other. Like, at, at a, like at a, at a, but like a base level right. of like women together. You know, that can be that can be a complicated business. But I bet it's a sexy, complicated business. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, what goes I, on behind the closed doors? I think you know if what they mean? were rolling around in underwear, hitting each other with pillows, you could possibly claim <laughs> yeah, that it was a male so. fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I no, no, no. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying fantasy. I'm saying a suspicion of what it would be like. That. But that they would be more natural with their own bodies, and you would, you know, and therefore it would be a bit of a tip, you know, a, a tip. No, I'm not going to go uh, uh, out on a limb and say, well, no, but it is exactly that way because I don't know. But I can certainly say that. Um, I'm just saying, I'm not saying in a deliberate way, but I'm, I'm wondering whether. From the female friends that I, I, I've had or the people yeah, I've dated okay. or whatever, uh, like I say, I, I obviously they're not like that around me, but certainly. Um, my understanding from conversations that I've had with women about such topics 
is that there is a, a and way. The holes are used to drilling the walls. No, there is a far more. <laughs> There is a, a, a comfort level that women have around other women that men don't have around other men uh, in the same way. And yet, you go into any kind of locker room and apparently certain types of men are perfectly happy to be, and I don't mean certain types of men as in homosexual, I mean certain types of men as in sporty types, weightlifters, whatever it is, Tackle out. are happy to walk around that way. Right. Whereas I, although in no way homophobic, or no way no, I would be deeply freaked out by this I would I have would a real problem yes. if when you came round to my house I was oh, like I'm just going to go change but I'm going to you know I have French doors in my house so there's windows in it and if I just stood by the window and just took all my clothes off that would be deeply weird yeah I mean if you bought me I, you know, my eye scrubbers oh, right okay? no no but I'm just no 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 I, I, take, I take your point and I'm I think male and I think male nudity true. exists but it exists in a kind of back slapping kind of <laughs> type way <laughs> well we are men together playing sport and <laughs> you know it exists in that way but it doesn't exist in also, a, I suppose there's a let's sit around in our apartment in our underwear and talk about is there, the movie here's my question right here's my question is there a sense that because if you're a woman right especially like a good looking woman right. you wander around all the time being ogled right there's lots of ogling happening your way right and you're like I don't quite get what all the fuss is about. Well, you also like, probably you know, feel objectified and, sure, that's and not terrified. Point. But sure, I am something. But I'm thinking, looking at what you've got and going, what, what's the big right. fuss about the, you know, the tits and the, the knees tits and whatever. The, right. But, you know, it's like constant. And then if you're living, you know, with another woman and you are confident, there must be like a certain amount like, I don't know, but like an admiration of the female form because, or an attempt to understand what's the big deal about this whole, well, it's also, know, I would, this whole breast farrago. I would say it's Can more... Can we subtitle the episode, this whole breast, breast The whole breast for Argo, sure. Um, probably get more downloads that way. Uh, <laughs> although people will be Googling Farago. <laughs> They're like, does he mean Fargo, the TV show? Um, no, I, I think that uh, th- there's some of that. I would, I would honestly, looking at it from a more... Trying to look at it, it's difficult, obviously, but trying to well, look at it from a more perspective. Feminist, feminist female perspective... I would argue it's less trying to understand it and more uh, more having the relief and relaxation of not having to uh, to be uh, of being able to be comfortable because you assume uh, that you're not being objectified, o- objectified and ogled right. for the first time in your day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and like. If you look at the men... It must be a, 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 an interesting old business being a lady. Yes, it must be. Um, <laughs> if you look at the men in this movie, uh, you have the gay friend upstairs, you have this, let's be fair, bit of a cad. Yes. Uh, of a, And he's not particularly drawn out in terms of character. All you know about him is he's a bit of a floppy head. He's, he's a cad and a bit of a... a bit like also... I don't know if he's necessarily a catch, but he lives in a hotel, right? Right. Which is odd. Why does he live in a hotel? I don't know. Because it's kind of a swanky 90s business thing to do. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Or, ah, no, uh, they were living together, she kicked him out, oh, he's yet to probably find right, his own place. That's why I came Although, out. at one point she goes, well, he might keep his own place for a while, and I'm like, but he doesn't have his own place, he's staying in a hotel. Yeah. So it's sort of weird. Unless it's one of those things that used to be a hotel and is now an apartment building. Hence why there was a doorman downstairs and not a check-in desk. I don't know. Could have been a check-in Who knows? desk. Could have been. It doesn't Could really have been. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. So yeah, that's a bit... But basically, he's a floppy-haired twat. Uh, <laughs> who... Who... Uh, weirdly, and we... Do, like, the other thing that's odd about this movie, and I, and I kind of want to get into, like... The movie making aspect of it rather than trying to like drill down and, and overanalyze yeah. anything but yeah. like you don't this... want to drill down into the test no <laughs> <laughs> the whole breast oh, breast farago. Farago. um which does sound <laughs> breast farago sounds like it could be a latin american uh like uh, singer crooner breast farago breast <laughs> breast farago yeah. and his Ladies mariachi <laughs> Rest Farago. Dang, 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 da, 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 da. Whatever. Yeah, anyway. Know, he plays maracas. I know you are dead. <laughs> he plays maracas. Yeah. I play maracas and I sing a song for the ladies. I am Rest Farago. Rest Farago sing a song <laughs> for the ladies. Um, uh, when he wiggled his maracas next to me. Um, <laughs> 
so anyway, there's a there's an odd thing in the movie that is it, that it is uh, unconcerned with uh, time, meaning no idea how long they've been living together. No, it seems odd that they've been living together for enough time for them to be living together and talking about engagement and blah 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 but his ex-wife is still calling him and he still has like business with his ex-wife right. I mean I get it like um, you know having been through one divorce and she, separation but seemingly stretch she's out. only just arrived in the city as well because right because she says I've not been just, in New York long yeah and also and like sort of think her that, business thing is her, his, her first client right and you sort of think that it's his place because she's like talking about uh, uh, he says oh I met you in New York and blah 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 blah. but then you find out it's her it's very like it's, it's yeah she un- gets an apartment at, in a legal settlement which I don't know yeah I don't understand how that happens either because okay so <laughs> let's delve into this now okay very quickly because there are some glaring plot points first of all in the movie making scheme of things yeah all the exposition is this movie is like 90% action and, or or not action as in like action movie but like people as doing in things stuff happening and 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 like 10% maybe not even 10% maybe 5% exposition and the exposition happens in the most convenient ways possible so she has a meeting at the beginning of the movie with Stephen Tobler right, right? Uh, the wonderful uh, 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 and the magnificent slightly, the magnificent but also in this movie slightly sleazy and deranged Definitely. I can't help that Spader would have Spader would have done a magnificent would have been a job been a but only like job. today's Spader today oh yeah no today's it would have had to been older fatter bolder Spader <laughs> definitely <laughs> uh, because Tobler Alski has a wonderfully bald cronium with mad he's, side he hair. is he is balding the sleeves all over the place thank you very uh, much. that one's mine thank you oh that's fine lovely thank you very much um so just have your stuff so he so said good. in his discussion with that there's your syrup I was thinking of a butter actually uh, no butter maybe I don't um, have butter it's fine maybe I don't have butter with griddle cakes do you want butter? no no I'm happy to have it the way that they're serving it so um, <laughs> these are some sorry looking he says in the meeting mm-hmm. very quickly he's like oh I looked up on you I, 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 I looked uh, into you and found out here, convenient character information that we've crowbarred literally into one sentence. The exposition of her entire character mm. is in one sentence, which is that she has some fashion software right. that is very early kind of 90s computer stuff, which basically puts different clothes on a digital mannequin. It's not really important. Um, <laughs> uh, that he or as far as I can tell, useful. Or also, useful. she appears right. to be in charge of his accounts. Right. Um, Actually, I could, can I just say one quick thing on the, on, the, on the particular subject? Can I admit... The half the time a, you didn't know what was going on? No, no, no. To a certain amount of admiration right. for the exposition in the opening scene, when she's lying in bed, yeah. and they establish... They do a lot of lying in bed there. with, like, blue light through a chiffon but, curtain. But they, they, they're, they're sitting there, and we, in the space of, like two minutes we find out who she is who he is what the relationship is how long um, like they've been in New York together what this apartment is like the whole the, what her business is in fact you know, no you don't find out her business until later often but the point is in a very short space of time in a reasonably believable way they get all this exposition out um, right well, the, I was just like just the movie doesn't build like the movie just starts yes it does um, which I quite liked. Yeah. And it, it started a little like a play. Yeah. It doesn't read to me like a movie. It started very much weird, like a it, play. It's based on a novel, too. Because if it had been based on a play, I wouldn't have been very surprised. Right, because it was very highly stylized, like a play might be. Yeah, or one location. Or one location. And you could definitely do this as a play. Yeah. So. Um, oh, this is very quick. Sorry, just very yeah. quick. I was genuinely surprised. Not only by how much I enjoyed it, but I thought it was. I thought I did generally think it was well directed. And yeah, it is the the Bob the Schroeder bloke who does this. Like the other things of his that I've seen. And he made Barfly, which is another very Barfly, which is based on the writings of Charles Bukowski, which is another set in one or two locations, very theatrical. Um, 
looking sets and is pretty much a sort of one or two hander between Mickey Rourke and um, Faye Dunaway in that movie, I think. I think so. But either way, I was just, I don't know, I was just, it, it was, it was, the way it was paced, the way it was shot, the music, what it was saying, the little moments happened, oh, yeah, the way not, that it all built up, I just thought it was, you know. It's not a bad movie, it, 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 it has an issue with pacing. Yeah. It has an issue with, in my mind, like convenient uh, exposition. Yeah. And, you know, um, it is, you know, very, very 90s. You know what I mean? It is exactly like, 90s. Especially the bit where, for no apparent reason, she goes to like an underground oh, the sex stuff. den. Well, because she's pretending to be her, right? No, I get that, but. She goes to an underground sex den, but then just sits at the bar and has a drink. Yeah, I have to say, that was the, I mean, I guess they wanted to up the weirdness factor. Like, you want to have, like, a bunch of things discovered about her. Right, there's, a was... point, there's a point where she's, when Bridget Fond is sitting with the, with the gay bloke, it, like, describing, like, all the weird things about Jennifer Jason May. And she goes, and then I found out well, she's been lying to me. Like, her twin didn't die at birth. Actually, the twin died when when she was nine, and I felt like I, well, if I was to go, but I go, so fucking what? Right. Like, give the girl a break. If she wants to pretend that the girl she was when she was nine, that's you know when she first met you. Let's let's let her have that one. There's actually very few, you know. There's just a feeling that something's not right. Right, but that's my other point. Is that everything we find out about Jennifer Jason Lee is revealed in a hastily look through a shoebox with this idea that. Well, because I'm a psycho, I must carry around a shoebox <laughs> that explains my psychotic tendencies. <laughs> but didn't she just want to talk to the... anybody or no? And okay, then, but... and then there's a lot of stuff at the opening, like, oh yeah, uh, this elevator's broken, so we use this handily, like, chained-on screwdriver to fix it. And oh look, we can hear everything that's going on in the apartment because of these. But men. yeah, but to be fair, and... to, yeah, yeah, but to be fair, but to be fair. Take the screwdriver an example, right? What I liked about the screwdriver example is I thought the same thing as you. Oh, that, that screwdriver is going to make an appearance. Right. And it did. When Bridget Fonda is being strangled. Right. And she's reaching for the screwdriver. So it's all like, it, it's going exactly as Hollywood would plan. You know, right. right at the moment she's about to die, she grabs a screwdriver that we told you about at the beginning of the movie. Right. And, you know, fights off Lee. But instead, she can't reach the screwdriver. Right. And to all intents and purposes, as far as the audience is concerned at that point, right. dies. Right. And that screwdriver never comes back. So the screwdriver only no, no. exists. No, no, because she's in the bloody tool room. That's what she stabs. She stabs her with the screwdriver at the end. Oh, okay. But it could have been a screwdriver from the tool room. There's like plenty of tools knocking but it's around. It's not. It's the big black one with the big black sure, handle. Sure. But my point is, is that the actual effect of having the, you know, that like, oh, the thing that right, was it, there earlier is right, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. to underline the fact that she really is dead. So right. it's, to, it's a clever use of that trope. No. Is what I'm saying. No, I get it. No, it's not. Look, it's not. Well, un- it did get really hot. It's not an unintelligent movie. <laughs> Right? I, was, I was expecting it to be proper... And it's, ent- dark, and it's entertaining. It's too slow and too drawn out for my particular... No, I would agree screen. with that. I would agree with that. Um, I prefer something a little pacier. I also think that if you're going to do the Hitchcock thing... Yeah. Go balls to the wall with the fucking music. The music was a little... Well, I quite like the music. It was all right. But, like, first of all, the first two thirds of the movie, there is no music. And then by the time there is any music... It's trying to do that annoying, well, I don't want to do the boom, boom, it's a thriller, by the way, music, so let's just try and do something that's a little bit more subtle and a little bit more whatever. And I'm like, just give me the boom, boom, because that's, that's kind of what this movie needs. Uh, an alternative subtitle for the podcast episode could be, just give me the boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't, I'd be saying, it's, it's out there. No, I yeah. agree, but I, I found it, I thought it was Or quite just, ole, it's breast rocker. <laughs> just give me the, the boom, boom, boom. Just yeah. give me the boom, boom, breast rocker. Um, yeah, look, I agree with you about the pacing. It was too slow. It wasn't slow. I, I, I never got bored. It, it felt drawn out. Like, it felt like once you find out who she was and what she was doing, like, there was then 
like there was then like a whole other section of the movie where sort of felt, they I were not say, talking about it, but they were talking about it, and then they weren't talking about just, it, and then a, a, lot, a lot of that, like Jennifer Jason Lee, you know, the twin and all that, seemed to me to be like irrelevant, frankly. And the more interesting, the more interesting dynamic between Jennifer Jason Lee and um, Bridget Fonda was not, oh, you're my missing twin that I get to whatever. The more interesting dynamic was, I'm ugly and plain and nobody looks at me. Those are the bits. Those are the bits. The heartbreaking bit was when the dog is scratching at the door after Bridget Fonda leaves. And Jennifer Jason Lee goes, come here, boy, come here, boy. I know, I understand. And the dog just keeps pouring at the door as if Jennifer Jason Lee isn't even there. Right. And, that's kind of, and she's like, fine. But it's like, that's her whole life. It's like being ignored and taken for granted and invisible right. next to a more attractive but I honestly, you know, woman or whatever. I honestly feel that that is something that the director Chappie and the two women and maybe the screenwriter and whatever like hashed out more of that and then the while well, she was also a twin and blah 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 was sort of kept in to kind of appease yeah I would agree with you. either the studio and or someone who but probably saying, went yeah but here's the twin thing for stupid people if if, if you I, I would be interested if you cut the beginning there, right. If you um, cut out the shoebox there, and you cut out the ending, yeah. Whether it wouldn't be like a more interesting movie, because then it would be about, like you're saying, questions of identity and femininity, and what does it mean to be a you know a plain girl, you know, right next to a much more attractive girl, and you know maybe you wouldn't want to be. I mean, it's so much. It seemed to be about wanting to be. Bridget Fonda. Here's Bridget Fonda wandering around feeling sorry for herself. Oh, my boyfriend cheated on me. You know, that thing that good-looking people do when they wander around, you know, just like... Well, he did cheat on her. I mean, that's a bit... No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying... She had every reason to be pissed off. I'm not saying she didn't. I'm just saying... When good-looking people wander around with the problems with of... good-looking people, right, yeah. You know, with the problems of, oh, my, you know, my perfect boyfriend cheated on me and, you know, now I get to be, you know, melancholy about it or whatever. And I'm not saying that's not true or real. Right. I'm saying when you're, you know, an ugly outside person, you fucking, you know, kill for those problems, you know, because they feel real and all you are is ignored and isolated. Right. I'm just saying that was the more interesting dynamic for me rather than the, oh, I, you know, I better live out some weird, like... Like not even explained childhood draw. Right. But it's just that, yeah, like you're saying, it's that like 90s tendency to, well, we better have something in the script that explains why she's a loon. Yeah, it's or like... people you... will leave the theatre go, with their monocles falling out, going, I say, <laughs> they never told us why she was a loony. Right. I don't want to have to think about it. <laughs> they gave me the tits, but it didn't say anything about thinking. <laughs> you know? But I see tits, my brain immediately switches <laughs> off. Yeah. I cannot be expected to both look at tits and think at the same time. Um, no, I think that, that was a genuine comment on an audience feedback card at a test screening. Yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Some like eager, yeah. like 21 year old, like party planner type being like, okay, so let's go through the card, shall we? <laughs> so, did the nudity bother anybody? <laughs> And it oh. up his <laughs> Let me explain something to you about men. <laughs> I can't be expected. <laughs> um. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was good. Yeah. And, and you're right, they don't make movies like that anymore. No. Where there's that much time. There's no, like... You know, if, if they made that now, then it would turn out that Jennifer Jason Lee was really a ghost. <laughs> Of a, of a magician's assistant, you know, who died 50 years ago or whatever. And the magician was part robot and trying to take over the planet. That's a very, I don't that's more of a 70s feel, I think. And Benedict Cumberbatch and fucking Tom Hiddleston had to waft about being wafted. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't get the Tom Hiddleston thing. Or the it's Benedict over Cumberbatch. my head. The two of them, I think if they ever appear in a movie together, they may have already done it. But I imagine that there's some sort of wafty time hole full of <laughs> ennui and tedium opens up probably and we all just kind of drift off into it I don't, like we get, just... I don't I know I don't, I don't get it I don't get this obsession I mean I still don't get I still don't get Craig as Bond frankly and I know for a fact that whoever they choose as the next Jodie Bond I'm not going to get it no I don't get it 
and, and, and the funny thing is, if people go, well, you know, that's because you're getting older. People always love the stuff that they like growing up, blah, 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 blah. And you go, yeah, but this isn't about me standing there going, will you turn down your loud guitar music? Like, it's not that. It's me going, look, I've watched movies. I know what things should be. And Craig isn't fun. He's awful. He's like a pod faced swimwear model twatting about being miserable. Casino Royale was like a like a test screened, you know, marketed to death. I, I, I couldn't watch it without seeing a bunch of marketing people going, we're so pleased with how gritty. It's a gritty reboot. Right. You know, it was so phony. I quite enjoyed Quantum of Solace, although not the second time I watched it, because it was like, at least it was like, we're just going to make an action film, right? Is that all right? We're going to make an action film. Who was it who said this about James Bond? Who was it who said this? Fuck, what was I watching the other day and someone made a comment? Right. Tell me what he was like, just for a minute, um, do you know what I don't understand? I don't understand James Bond. He's like, he's got a license to kill, um, he can shag any woman he wants, and um, uh, whatever the third thing is, he gets to drive around in fast sports cars. He's like, why all the misery? <laughs> it was on, I think it was on a Comedians in Cars getting coffee, one of those. Uh, I think it was like, um, I don't think Seinfeld said it, I think someone else said it. Norm Macdonald, I think. Okay. He was like, I don't get it. Why all the misery? <laughs> there are some things that you shouldn't be, you know, glum about. But then, okay, so here's my question, right? If things are a product of their era, right? Right. Take, you know, the 70s, there's obviously, there's a lot of, you know, there's paranoia, governments can't be trusted. Right. You know, everyone's listening. Uh-huh. We're all fucked. This means nothing. All the darkness is coming to get us now. Right. And the 80s is like, money is great. And... Bum, colors bum, and cars and, yeah. and even like and, and just like life is great like it's you know it's kind of a shallow thing, but like Beverly Hills Cop and all those movies are all like people are like running out and they're like having a fucking blast even the criminals and everyone is like right. having, having a ball about yeah. being alive yeah. even though it's kind of dirty and grimy and whatever it's still you know it's life um, so in the 90s with the whole home invasion thing and the single white female which seems to me to be like hello I might look normal but actually, I'm insane. I'm going to well, kill you. Do you want to? Do you want to know what it is? Yes. It's the rise of two things. Okay. First of all, all the people who have made their money in the '80s, mm-hmm. the yuppies, now want to like keep it and are fearful of anyone coming to get what's theirs, get their stuff. Interesting. Right. And that could because they know deep down inside them that they had to like step on a few necks to get it. They're constantly looking behind them who's going to come step on their neck to get theirs, right? We've talked, we've talked before. Because this was a recession. I mean, 90s was, for the first five or six years anyway, a big recession. Right, but we've talked before, right, about how uh, uh, CEOs and upper management and all those people we have to deal with every day, right, are paranoid. Like, they're constantly panicked and constantly fearful and paranoid because, like, well, wait a minute, uh, if something goes wrong, is it my fault? Like, can I blame Johnson? Uh, is Johnson trying to come for my job? Like, this is the thing. So that, the rise of, like, middle management, basically. Right. So there's all that fear going on within the yuppie mind. But the other thing um, is... Um, what was the other thing? I don't know. It was good, though. I was... I was damn it, I had two well, things. Well, I'll tell you what, because you, you often think of it while I'm talking... It's because I'm not listening to you. <laughs> right, precisely. <laughs> I wonder whether the... Because I really like the yuppie thing, but whether it's also because after a, like a, a big um, uh, you know, explosion of you know, corporations in America, where all of a sudden you have like a huge middle management class. Because everybody that I know or I've worked with over my life who is like, you know, paranoid and freaking out all the time about things going wrong and then losing their job and right. losing everything. Are just are middle managers. They're not the people at the top. They're like the middle managers who've like been given responsibility they've never had before, and they're right. basically told, "Well, the company will fall down if you don't get your job right." right, right. right. And there's suddenly I don't know, millions of these people raised out of like you know coming out of college or whatever, and all of a sudden it's like middle management jobs. There's all these now big established corporations. Right. This money, the stock market, all of the benefits of the '80s. Yeah, there's a recession, but they're still like you know big fucking companies and I wonder whether that's not it it's not playing into that particular um, paranoia for the first time where people are people are understanding like what being a manager is you know what I mean yeah I mean yeah I, I didn't go like 
too far into it. My my feeling is that... Well, I, like, I like your thing, though. My, my, my feeling is that if there is any kind of underlying trend of these kind of, like, 90s thrillers... Yeah. ...is that it's not the fear of... Um, the other. The other. It's the fear of ourselves and the people we've surrounded ourselves with... Um, and the yeah, there is often like a doppelgangery thing going on those movies too. Like, well, at least it's not in looks, but in like they have similar jobs. You know, they, they they look the same. They dress them, but the same yeah. social. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. They're separated by nothing really. That's you know the yeah. same upbringing. So I wonder if that I've I, I've not been able to remember what my second thing was, and that is kind of killing me. I've remembered what it is, and I thought I'd stick it in post, as they say. <laughs> It was some sort of phlegm gumptionary about uh, the whole rise in the 90s of the inner you and the inner child and psychotherapy and psychology and all that sort of stuff kind of becoming mainstream for the first time. So there was a lot of that sort of the inner child and, you know, talk about your feelings and everyone becoming more sensitive and stuff like that. So I wondered if that and the yuppie thing uh, and the 90s thing and all that sort of stuff, whether that played into it as well. There must be a reason why there was like a rise of thrillers at that time. Um, and so maybe it was maybe it was to do with that, the sort of fear of self, but also fear of others and paranoia and psychology and all that kind of stuff that's played out uh, by the rise of therapy and uh, self-help books. Anyway, back to the show. There's certainly the beginning of the... Uh, certainly in this movie anyway, the kind of um, uh, money disparity, the haves and the have-nots and the, that kind so of thing going on. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think this one in particular uh, is, is far more about... I think, I think it's far more about femininity and... Um, female friendships and things like that than it is and 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 like i say like and you said quite right like body identity uh, uh uh fashion like i think the fact that she's a fashion designer yeah and the first time you see them uh together is shopping for clothes i think that's speaking to a certain thing as well um, so fear of not dressing right like identity right and, and all the rest of it and and you know, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not little, knowing how to dress, I'm not knowing how to fit in. Right, I still have that feeling where I know I want to say something that I can't say it, so I'm, yeah. kind of everything I'm saying is kind of frustrating me. But yeah, I, I think we've, we've got in there somewhere, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's interesting, because I was thinking that before. The After Movie Diner with John Cross will return right after this. We'll do it live! F*** it! Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Hi, I'm Jay Mayo. And I'm Marie... Shut up! I'm Marie... Shut up! I'm Marie Forster. And we are co-hosts of Hold the Mayo Podcast. Hold the Mayo! Hold the Mayo! All right, give me ham on five, hold the Mayo. We're two local comedians, and here on Hold the Mayo, we talk about all the different things that are going on in our daily lives. Or in your case, your pathetic dating life. Or in your case, your obsession with pizza. Or in your case, your Gatham for Statham. Yeah, well, at least I'm not obsessed with Guy Fieri. At least I'm a gang leader. No, you're not. You're just always trying to overthrow invisible gangs. No, I'm cool in the gang. No, you're... Oh, my God, you're the puns are the worst. <laughs> Mayonnaise, Really? That stuff is for sandwiches. Listen, you guys can find us all across the internet. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, and everywhere else that podcast can be found. You can also find us all across social media. We're on Twitter at Hold the Mail Pod, Instagram at Hold the Mail Podcast, and of course, we have a Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash Hold the Mail Podcast. Don't forget, you can also find Jay crying on his couch every single night. Thank you so much. Fucking thing sucks! <laughs> <laughs> and just end it with a fart. What is the Pottern family? <laughs> Hi, I'm Gareth. I'm Bex. And we're from the Gareth's Random Rambling Podcast. This is Jason from the Three Is Comedy Podcast. This is Adam from Everyone Has a Podcast. This is Michael Vasquez.
of the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast. This is Eric Mocker from the Mockers Podcast. Hey, this is Rick from Ice and the Face. This is Nick from the Epic Film Guys Podcast. This is Turbo from the Turbo Cast. This is Matthew McDonough from the Passers By Podcast. This is Cyanide from the Little Geek Lost Podcast. This is Paul from the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast. This is Daniel from the Toe on the Trigger Podcast. This is Matt Pierce from the Crossover Podcast. Hey guys, it's Rad Dad Chad, J Mills, and Lil Man from the Full of Fiber Podcast. Hey y'all. That's Juliet Miranda from the Unwritable Rant Podcast. This is Nock from the Geek Yogurt Podcast. This is Gareth from the Open All Powers Podcast. This is Octopus Caveman. And this is the Green Korean from the Dave Podcast. We're Josh and David from the Scotch and Flicks Podcast. This is Greg from the Sports Dance Podcast. Hey, this is Bro from the World of Row Podcast. We are you. Podcasters coming together in a community to help one another grow. So follow us on Twitter at Potter and Family and use the hashtag Potter and Family in your tweets and retweet other people who do the same. Potter and Family, where great podcasts come home. You're listening to the sweet sounds of the After Movie Diner. Support us at P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash After Movie Diner or I'll punch you in the teats. Rate and review us on iTunes, Earthling. I don't necessarily know if I can look at a film from, say, I don't know, 2010 and go, oh, yeah, well, that's a product of, like, what, you know, this is what's going on in society. But I feel like now we're far enough away from the 90s where we're going to go back and go, yeah, what the fuck was going on with, like, with the 90s? What was that all about? Because on the one hand, um, I remember it quite fondly. Like, there was a lot of good art, there was a lot of good music, and there seemed to be, like, a cautious feeling of, like, hope and optimism that maybe we might sort this mess out. But, there but was at the also, same time, like, there was a recession, but the big movies the of people the, in charge were, like, fucking arseholes. The big movies of the 90s, though, that have, have lived on kind of thing are... Uh, like the Scream franchise, like the sort of the reemergence of the like ironic slasher or whatever, um, and the you know rip offs that came from that one um, are things like you said, like Independence Day and, and Jurassic Park and a couple of those big blockbusters. Yeah, but, like, but then, sorry. but then you also have the indie wave, which is your uh, Pulp Fiction, your Reservoir Dogs, your Clerks, your Slacker. There was a trailer for Slacker tonight. Uh, Richard Linklater, all those kind of things. All those things. Robert Rodriguez. The um, the indies and the blockbusters all had one thing in common, which is a growing shared. Well, there were genre films as well. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm being more specific now. A growing um, shared cultural language. In other words, we're all expected to like we laugh and scream because we all know the rules of the horror films. You know, we laugh at or enjoy Pulp Fiction as well, dogs, because of like even if we don't fully understand the references, we get that they're in there, that they're packed in there, and we, we like, get that it's a it's, it's, joy from that. we get that it is taking a genre and doing something slightly different with it, even if someone had done but it. It's, but, but it's more like there's a joy in, in recognizing that we all well, we all get it. Yeah, yeah, we're all in on and the I joke. I feel like yeah. that was the thing in the mind, just like with screen, particularly that idea of and hey, even in, like even in Independence Wars, Day. Although they don't like reference it necessarily. Well, no, he does say about ET. It was really like, like I, I just so, punched yeah. ET in the face or something. Oh yeah. But yeah, like yeah. they, I tell you what it is: the people in movies in the nineties live in a world in which movies exist. Whereas yeah, it, and that only slowly starts to happen throughout the eighties. In movies in the sixties and seventies, while they might be commenting on a genre. They don't live in a world in which other movies exist. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, They're not yeah, sat yeah. there referencing whatever it is, left, right, and center. Um, and I feel that there are probably a bunch of 80s comedies that I can't think of as on my head, but will probably reference movies that have come before. And I don't mean like redo them, I mean in, in the language, in the in the in the dialogue. Yeah. Um, but certainly by the time uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino and, and Kevin Smith start doing it it becomes and, and Scream Kevin, Kevin Williamson it becomes just a rigor to do it in right but I, mean, I think, I think that, that's, that speaks to a certain like I found that at the time very comforting like this idea that the things that I cared about you know that I thought were cool are, are like not only cool to other people but are like important and cool to everybody and that we're all to know these things 
it's, it's, I don't know, it gives you some kind of, like if you're not, you have just wasted your time watching movies and, and learning about music and becoming obsessed about Star Trek or whatever. Right. Like you haven't wasted your time. You've, you've, you've gained some kind of cultural but I, and knowledge I, and that I, allows you to like live in the world. And I think that the people who are listening to, whether it's grunge and uh, uh, the states or Britpop in the in the UK, and watching movies by those um, uh, indie filmmakers at the time, or the, the Miramax crew at the time, um, are probably a different audience than the ones who are sitting down to watch Single White Female. And while as a filmmaker, mm. I was I'm sorry, as a as a film watcher in the 90s, I was readily aware of Single White Female being out, and I may have even like seen bits of it. Uh, it did always strike me as kind of a, as, a, as a weird chick flick. It right? was a it was huge like a, rental, though. It was a yeah. huge rental. And yes, it, you see the front cover and you go, well, even if it is a thriller and even if there are norks in it, you know, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's probably a woman's it's, film. It's and I was, you know, I was like 16, 17, so I'm like, yeah, probably for birds. <laughs> uh, and I probably just watched it, uh, you know, on a friend's VHS or something. But like... Uh, that and like I say, Goldie Horn Deceived and Unlawful Entry and um, uh, what are the other ones that he mentioned at the beginning of the movie? Um, the terrible Pacific, Heights, yeah, Pacific Heights, which we actually watched and covered for the show, which is awful. All of them, and even like Sliver and Basic Instinct and stuff, which got most of the column inches because of all the sex and violence in them. Um, they're all mostly awful. I mean, they're, they're fun to watch, but they're all sort of mostly awful. Yeah. Um, they're no, not. I they're can't not think a, of a particularly good one off the top of my head. I, I feel like they're a genre that could be enjoyed, like ironically, which I don't like to do. No, I find myself sometimes having a perverse ability to enjoy like very specific genres. You right. Know what I mean? No, no. Don't. Go, okay. Don't get me wrong. And I can see how there, there's a, there's a world where he goes. For some reason. Right. I really like. Totally, and, and I, imagine, I love like I love if I'm going to pick a horror genre, like I love slasher films. It doesn't matter how bad and crappy they are. It doesn't matter if it's a robicide or Fatal Games or whatever. Like I like those slasher. Films. I can is, watch. This is them. A John Donnell plays the same way. Like, Endlessly, he only wants to watch films unless there's a guy in a mask with a knife right. hacking up teenagers. He's not interested. Right. And I like them uh, for whatever reason. And there is a part of me, don't get me wrong, that likes these 90s thrillers. Like, there was... So when uh, uh, Amazon and everything else and, and then, uh, you know, and torrenting and various and streaming and various other things, one of the films that I'm sad hasn't got, like, uh, its moment in the, in, in the spotlight It is weirdly enough, Goldie Horns to see. <laughs> I don't know why. It's one that I watched... Uh, I think my mum rented it or something when we were, like, teenagers. I remember watching it and going... Okay. Pretty fun, actually. I mean, it's mostly bollocks, but it's pretty fun. Um, yeah, but there is something to be said. And I was like... just like, I wish I had it. Like, I wish I had the VHS of Goldie Horns to see. I don't know why, but I wish I did. And, uh, you know, one day it'll have its moment in the sun. Uh, but right now, it doesn't. Uh, but, but I, and I feel like um, Single White Female, I don't know whether I can recommend it. I don't know whether I can go, yeah, track this one down, it's better than you thought it was, because it's not really. But there's a lot to it. I have to say, it was better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be, like, forgettable, by the numbers, one, two, three, like, you know. Right. Um, but bird moves in, bird starts dressing like other bird, bird goes crazy, other bird kills crazy bird at the end. Right. Which is what happened. It is what happened. <laughs> it is what happened. It is what happened. But I did. I I thought I had. I did have sympathy for Jennifer Jason Leigh, but only not in the bits where she's killing animals. No, I get it. I get it. I get in it. the bits where she felt alienated. From it's the horribly world, underwritten though, because, like, in in reality, if someone, if you, for example, if you had shown up right. tonight and I had shaved my head and shaved my face and was wearing whatever that shirt is, yeah, you'd be a little like you wouldn't let it go. You wouldn't be like, well, blah. You'd be like, yeah, but to okay, be fair, what are you doing and what's going fair, on? At that, but at, at that point, and I, and I think it got this bit quite in terms of the pacing, they, she already knew something was up. This was, I think, right after the bus to blah, 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 blah tried to um, rape her. Yeah. Rape her right? and I Which also she, was a wholly unnecessary bit of side plot. Well, because I thought it was going to be like a deeply objectionable, misogynistic ending to the film. Right. Where James Jason knew was going to be like saved from the murderous lesbian. By like her male rapist, and I thought that would be. You mean you mean Bridget Fonda was going to be saved? Yeah, it was going to be saved. 
by her rapist right. from a murderous lesbian. Yeah. And, uh, like, just, I'm not, I don't, I, no, I don't, I'm, that, And I that think you're making a slight stretch that she was a lesbian. No, I know, but I'm just saying that, you know, you can see it that way. Save me from the lesbian, even though you're a rapist, at least you're a man, you know, kind of thing, kind of vibe. Right, right, right. But I quite like that. Um, so Blasky was like dismissed Jennifer Jason and they got knocked over the back of the head and then I was going so what's going to happen to oh she's put Christian over his head and shot him yeah. was, um, I found that quite pleasing right. because there was an element of when, when Jennifer Jason Lee well, says to her you know I've helped you out there's like well yeah you know you shot her right just in the head and to some extent wait but then okay. that was an act of love in, but you could say okay way. talking about things that could be completely taken out of this movie right Todd Blasky could be completely taken out of this movie because what ends up, what happens with Toblowski? All Toblowski does is establishes that uh, she is a fashion thing, which doesn't need to be established. And 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 lastly, is one of many people who can hilariously, in a near, hang on, in a near farcical style, almost be the one to save her. Like there was, I felt like there was like a million people going to that apartment and constantly being dispatched. There wasn't. There was only like a couple. But like even so. It was, especially the way that, that like, Toblowski goes, but wait a minute, that's her suitcase. And the moment he hears mumbling from inside, instead of doing any, instead of, like, thinking about it or saying something or whatever, he literally just grabs Jennifer Jason Lee, flings her out of the way and bounds into the apartment. Like, it, it got a bit stupid. Well, but that, you know what that, I mean? that, that, no, and then, then there's, there's all this business with oh well we've got to go to LA and then she's trying to write on the internet you know and then that doesn't work and then and then the gay guy's secretly still awake in the bathtub and then it, like it just it was like alright enough already like someone hit <laughs> then they go down to the basement and there's 20 more minutes of twatting around and I'm like well someone just club her around the face with a heavy no, because, object no because okay alright in its defence and I'm, and I'm not saying it was like well done or anything but in its defense the Stephen Toblowski thing made sense because the the trajectory of that was he was made furious by like her fucking up his you know computers about her. and he comes around he he knows that she's in this apartment and there's this bird with her suitcase that she does know and yeah she spurious, hears her, she's, like, oh, she's in there he so knows I'll because she anyway, was cat really sitting really and really he gave, she gave him the number like all this extraneous detail cat sitting it's cat sitting with the gay cat stairs no, I agree. Asking, I, like all this I agree. the I only agree. thing no wait, wait, wait I'm, 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 okay, I'm, I'm sure. not in its defense leaving aside the debate Although, personally, I think Tabaski was all worth it. No, I'll tell you why. Nearly being saved by a rapist, but then seeing the woman shooting the rapist. No, there's another reason why he's in it. Okay, sure. But what I'm saying is, from Bridget von Fonda's point of view, it's like, on the one hand, obviously she wants to be, like, saved, but equally, seeing the guy that tried to rape her being shot in the head must have felt like a little bit good. So there's there's an interesting thing going on there. Anyway, what I I think... Can I... One more thing on Tabaski. Okay, right. The reason why he's in it? Why? Right up until the end, right up until the end, she has to seem like a victim. Yeah, okay, but that's actually... No, so, and no, I but, don't... But, but wait, wait, but, so hang on a second. Even no, no, though, no, but that's, that's what I was going. That's even like, though she turns around and knees Toblowski and runs out of there, which totally, absolutely fine, any, like, follow-up and recourse and repercussion to that... She gives up on like she's like oh he's gonna trash my name all over town yeah. and that's it I'm back to square one and he was my meal ticket and blah 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 um, and it's Jennifer Jason Lee who like calls him up in the dead of night and is like if you do anything wrong or if you say anything wrong like I'm coming after you and your family and blah 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 and she that is a that plays into Jennifer Jason Lee like soliloquy at the end about like how I've helped you and how I'm the strong one and I've never met anyone who's so afraid to be alone and all these opinions Jennifer Jason Lee has about Bridget Fonda and the whole point of it is you've underestimated me because look at me better you in the end kind of thing. Right, but that's what I mean. Like I, I think all those all that stuff is she's supposed to be like, I'm I'm good with computers, so I'm gonna use the computer to try and save myself. And in the end that gets turned against her. Well, right. that, that was quite a neat scene where Jennifer Jason Lee's like doing a, a monologue about how I don't deserve to die and think yeah she's got a thief and then She's just dictating a suicide. And it was just a, it was a nice little gap. But in other words, Jennifer Jason Lee turns the fact she's good at computers against her by making her write a suicide. There's all these things that 
like Bridget Fonda tries, like turning up the computer, oh, sorry, turning up the volume and then the people come in and Toblowski, you know, coming in and whatever. The point is, and being like the damsel in distress, like literally, like, you know, almost literally untied from the train tracks. Right. Um, and she goes through all of these roles, like you say, like victim or like, oh, I'm, the, I'm going to use my, you know, computer skills or whatever. And in the end, she defeats him basically by, like, turning her fear against Jason Jason Lee. So Jason Lee has obviously at this point operated on scaring the crap out of Bridget Fonda and presumably has scared a lot of people in her life and therefore presumably manipulated circumstances around her to some extent using this weapon of, well, I may be mousy and I may be plain and people may ignore me, but once I start scaring the crap out of them, you know, it all changes and I can to some extent get my way that's a twisted, fucked up way. No, it's it a was, way. No, I get it. So to, to, to go, she had to go through all that. And I, no, I'm not saying it was like well done, but I right. feel like it did have to be there so that when she, you know, throws the rat on her and hides from her and jumps on her and all that and like Batman's her at the end and all the rest of it, there's an element of not just, um, you know, empowerment, but also... Um, learning, as it were, to turn... I, I don't know, I guess to turn... To turn her own fear and, and use her own weapon. We are all done, yes. We're all Sorry. Done. It was very, very nice. It's just too many One and thing else? Uh, I think it was get, yeah, right? just the check is fine. Thanks for checking. Thank you very much. No, uh, so. There's also this interesting voiceover at the end of it, which initially is a little like, oh, wait a minute, we have to wrap this up and put a bow on it. Well, that's kind of what I felt. Right. But, I'm but now I think drunk. about No, well, now I think about it, based on the discussion we've had. There is a little, and, and especially based on the whole idea of, because at the end she's talking about Jennifer Jason Lee's problem was that she could never forgive herself for the death of her sister. Right. And that must have been an absolutely unbearable burden to live with this whole time and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I'm trying really hard not to blame her for Sam, her fiance, who she killed. Cat. Um, blah 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 and I'm trying to like find myself and so and so forth I think and again it would be so much better almost to be talking to a woman about this movie because I really think that there is something in the female experience in this film and one of the reasons why Tom Lowski is in there as the rapist boss and one of the reasons why there's the cad who still like occasionally sleeps with his ex-wife and also why there's like the gay best friend to some extent I think these are all, um, yeah, they're all cliches, but they're all things that I think women, certainly at the time, probably, but definitely now, still deal with, um, or still experience, or still know about. So, there is a certain thing where throughout the movie, if you take out Jennifer Jason Lee for the moment, and you just look at the Bridget Fonda character, there's a certain thing where that character is having to speak to uh, uh, all women to some extent. And Jennifer Jason Lee's character is also speaking to uh, all women as well. And the reason why the film ends with like the picture Thank you. Thank you that is much. one half her face and one Which half was pretty the good. other face that was pretty cool. is I think it's something along the lines of trying to say that Actually, if truth be told, we're all a little bit of both those people. And nice. most women have, or most people have, uh, some element of both those people within them. Yeah, I like Just that. Just so happens to, ask to, be, happen to be women in this film. Um, we all go through experiences, whether it's this boss or whether it's the, the husband or whatever, and we're all just trying to kind of, like, figure this stuff out. And if we... Uh, if we don't deal with the issues as they come along, um, you know, they'll hang about and they'll change us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you too. Thanks. You know, they'll hang about. If we don't deal with the problems as they arise, they'll hang about and they'll change us. Uh, there's something going on in all of that. There's some... Uh, thing You're right. I was the wrong person to go see that film. You should have gone and seen it with a lady. No, I'm just saying because I would have. I would welcome. Like, I really hope we get some emails or some feedback or some comments or something because I really like would be interested to sort of hear that perspective on the movie because I feel like 
while we can watch it, and I think we're fairly uh, well-rounded and observational, a gentleman of the Certainly world, in shape. despite all the bosom talk. Um, I was going to say, I'm not sure the women would have made it past me going, oh, checks. Yeah, 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 no, I understand. I apologise, um, ladies. But I think that we're fairly uh, uh, empathetic and understanding to some extent, or certainly recognise um, some of the ills of the world, let's just say. Um, so therefore we did get a lot out of this movie as well but I do feel that if this movie is speaking to anyone uh, it's speaking to the female audience yeah, uh, I as would, a whole I would go along with that. both in the 90s but also now like I don't feel like yes there were aspects of it that were incredibly 90s you know what I mean like the, the sex club with that same old song that's in I think every single yeah, one yeah that of was weird movies. Enigma it was Enigma it was um, sex club of course it is because Enigma Sex Club goes together um, the cost the clothing was obviously very 90s um, but I feel like it, I feel beyond that it was a fairly universal story there wasn't anything no. in it that struck me as like no, yeah. isn't that laughably 90s if you remade it today you wouldn't have to change it change that much I don't know maybe something with the phones I don't know I don't know whether it was one of those phones that would be affected by Oh, because they had answer machines and phones and stuff. Yeah, and at the, at the beginning, she heard the wife disclaim that she had had sex with uh, yeah, Beyonce yeah, 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 yeah. over the answer machine. But they, you, could have done, you could have done that with a text. I mean, it was so... Like, he was bound to get caught. Like, if she's calling him up, going, right. oh, I thought you... Uh, like, two in the morning or whatever it was. So, I don't know. Like, there's a lot in there. It's fairly interesting. And yet... And there's a lot to talk about. And yet... Weirdly enough, and it's well directed, well lit, very, very thoughtfully shot. Like even with the nudity, there are a lot of sequences where the people are in shadow. Yeah, yeah. there's bits when Jennifer Jason Leigh was, was like proper. They're right in the silhouetted or in shadow. No, right at the beginning, she's filmed in this quite creepy way because of the shadow. Not Jennifer Jason Leigh, Bridget Fonda when she got up to walk out. No, I'm sorry. I meant when yeah, when Jennifer Jason Leigh's like talking in. And then later when Bridget yeah. Fonda's getting changed, she's about to go upstairs in her nightgown, and Jennifer Jason Leigh's like, "You're not going to go up like that, are you?" So then we go into uh, Bridget Fonda's room, yeah. and she changes into clothes, but she does it completely in dead black yeah. silhouette, um, which again I feel was like really conscious, really well thought out, really. Like, there's an eye to it, a good cinematographer, a good whatever. And yet, and yet, weirdly for me, it's not one that I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to revisit that. Yeah. Anytime I, no, I, soon. I agree. I'm, I'm, so it's, it's a weird this. one. I'm glad, I'm glad I saw it. Right. And I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought it was going to. And I definitely, like you say, I definitely got things out of there. And it made me think about, it made me think about the era. And it made me think about, you know, ladies and what they have to go through. And it made me think about... You know, me as a bloke, I guess, to some extent, but all that. Um, I do, I do enough of that. But yeah, I know what you mean, and I'm not sure that all of that necessarily added up to like a fun film or a good film that I would say to people. Yeah, you should watch Super White People. I feel like if someone goes, "Oh, I've I've broken my leg." and I'm in hospital and the TV's only got one channel and single white females about to start I'd go yeah you could do that give it a go yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels don't to me turn like it off I've, and have I've, a snooze I've not seen Beaches all the way through but it feels to me like the anti-Beaches yeah. yeah it's kind of the antithesis of those kind of films but then maybe in Beaches they get into an argument as well I don't know I've not seen it I get I, the feeling that I, I agree is. though I would if if there are female viewers or um, listeners to the diner, I don't know if there are, but if there are... It's about 35% of our listening audience yeah. are female. Well, if 35%, like, yeah, write in and say what they got out to what female, I'd be really, inter- genuinely really interested to know. And I'm, I'm yeah. going to ask Teresa, because I don't know if she's seen it or not. I might ask her. I'd, I'd be, I, I would like to know, because I do think it was... I it did make me think, but sometimes there are, there are movies that I enjoy. i tell you what I think, right? Like, some of those movies I'm sitting there going I'm enjoying this this is quite fun but it's also kind of not really for me right. you know what I mean it's not made for me it's not speaking to me here's that, the explanation that way here's the explanation we can both sit there and analyse it intellectually so it can yes. hit us on a mental level where like yeah, 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 totally yeah. understand where this is coming from we've both had female friends explain to us about what they go through and how they feel on a daily basis and yada 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 we've read stories about bosses in that regard we've, we've experienced uh, uh uh, men who are like that fiance husband guy or whatever it is like 
or we can put ourselves in that position or whatever it is but we are like well aware of the things intellectually yeah but not at all but there is no and that doesn't have to be in a movie but there was no audience surrogate for us yes good point in the film that's a good way that's a good way to, I, mean, I was, I was going to say yeah we can go intellectually but it's not like which makes it a feminist movie it's not hitting a, you know hitting us uh, it's not hitting us in the gut do you know what I mean we're not no. being dragged along emotionally by it which I didn't feel and you're right the reason I'm being dragged along emotionally is yeah there's no surrogate for us in that movie because we're it's watching it, right? We're watching it That's from a we're that watching it from a perspective of while I can recognise there is things talking to women in it. Ultimately, I'm watching it as psycho chick goes psycho and right, right, right. Someone, I wonder if when women watch it, this is what Tommy Lee said to If women, when women watch it, they feel like you're saying with a split photo at the end, whether sometimes they feel with thunder and sometimes they, you know. Empathize right. with Jason Lee, and that goes back and forth because I imagine that would be quite a weird dynamic to go through. Yeah, and it would also be interesting to do. I've always had this thing. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong or right, but I find realistic and truthful uh, uh, male bonding uh, friendships or brothers or whatever in movies are very difficult to actually do. We've all seen the buddy cops or the you know, the laddish best friend, the men behaving badly types or the Seth Rogen types or whatever. But I don't feel like I'm any of those people. I don't feel like that's my friendships or that's whatever. I don't sit yeah. around in a Mostly group. in movies, it's bickering, isn't it? Like, that's how they... Right. But I, 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 I don't feel like I sit around with my friends smoking endless pot and talking about, like, skateboarding videos or whatever. Like, I, that doesn't really speak to me. Um, you know, frat boy comedies don't speak to me in terms of, like, me being on the screen. Um, and uh, uh, buddy cop things and stuff like that you know irascible old men they like that that I go oh yeah I see myself in that so like you know the Woody Allen comedies or Larry David or whatever it is or uh, um, who's the guy who did the um, he did a lot of those comedies that ended up on that he did like Mother and this is um, oh, Albert, Brooks. Friend, Albert Brooks those kind of films I guess so but like not not really. You know, it's very difficult because, you know, they all come from America with a different experience to some extent. Um, the ones where I feel they get it right in a weird way is like kind of the Wes Anderson movies. And although they're incredibly stylized, I think he does male relationships very, very, very well. Yeah, that's well. true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it may be the fact that he is friends with three very close brothers who he also collaborates with frequently and maybe that plays into it. But I think the Wes Anderson movies do male relationships in a way that I can relate to, albeit through parody and stylized and whatever, I, I recognize it way more than I recognize yeah, 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 the yeah. other cliche tropes. And I wonder, and you know, again, um, a lot of uh, women in cinema are reduced to cliche, whether it's the gangster's mall or the sexy ingenue or whatever it is. Like there's a lot Look of... With a heart of gold. with a heart of gold. Right. Blah, 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 blah. And so, first of all, I wonder if single white female doesn't present a slightly more uh, relatable uh, pair of females, minus the crazy, but you know what I'm saying. Relatable females. Certainly up to relatable a point, females. you know, where Bridget Fonda is, yeah. is kind of like um, going through And stuff. I wonder if you could do, uh, and I don't mean this in a sexist way, but I wonder if you could do a male version um, without it just being a Ray Liotta in Unlawful Entry as a psycho, as a psycho, as a psycho. Yeah, like, you're right, there wouldn't, whatever, be, there wouldn't or, be that feeling of camaraderie or unity or I mean you know part, part of the whole part of, of, of the feminist because they're both victims is, they're both victims in the film right, right. both in the single white and, and one, men, one, of the things, one of the things that happens in feminism is they hate you know when when there's like arguments between women they, they hate they've got enough to deal with without arguing you know fucking each other over and right. arguing amongst ourselves and there's right. that there's an element of that I would imagine about being a woman right. you know and that's you know to accept that's what's going on and the the, the lesson that Bridget from the chooses to take from the whole thing is not, you know, well, I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, duped again, or I'm, you know, I'm not going to let my guard down, or whatever. It's I'm going to, I need more empathy in my life because right. she went mad, you know, due to always being overlooked. Yeah, and without, without that empathy, without. But I, oh, I tell you what it is as well. 
Jennifer Jason Leigh is a victim or chooses to be a victim because of the way she feels about herself, her body, her clothing, her mind, her whatever, her, the way other people have treated her and so on and so forth. And Bridget Fonda, who seemingly has it all, is a victim because all these individual things start happening to her that victimize her, whether it's her fiance, yeah, 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 right, right, uh, right. the boss or whatever it is. And so like, I, I think it is. I think that whoever wrote it probably thought, well, how do I take one woman, break it out into two, and then have it come back together again? Like the idea that everyone has those conflicting personalities in them, and on some days women could go, oh, I'm so ugly and I'm so whatever, and that can really bother them. And on other, and men as well, but I'm just saying in this case. Um, and on other occasions, uh, feel themselves to be empowered and, and, and uh, wonderful and, and uh, successful and so on. And that dichotomy is presented not in one person, but two. Yeah, I know. I, I think you're right. I think that, that, that makes sense to me. I'm it boiling does. it down and I don't want to sound like cliche or sexist no, or anything no, no, because like look, look, I'm look, trying look, to just quicken but, up my but, point. But look, the point. Look, the point you're going to see a movie, right? Whether it's made for you or not, especially if it's not made for you, is... Um, like, even when you see a film, like when you see films from foreign countries, whatever, that are obviously not made for you, like, I don't know, um, Korean period dramas or whatever. Have you watched a lot of Korean period dramas? Well, no, I did pick that out because I have been, like, for some reason, a lot of, and we watched a, a, like a, a naval, like a historical naval battle. Yeah. It was like very famous in Korea and it was yeah. like this big historical war epic. It was, yeah. You know, and it was it was really good, but like it's obviously like not for me. It was right. made for me, it's made for Korean people. Right. And hopefully with enough explosives to like, you know, get the bombs and seats internationally. But you can watch it and and like the culture of it and how this war went down and, and what the history of this country was is interesting and you gauge what an intellectual like, maybe not on that like identifying necessarily with that because you don't really know the ins and the outs and the culture of the, right. why this is such a big battle and what the whole thing is and it's it feels like a learning experience and that could be a good thing but I guess the point is so what you're that, trying to say is watching single white female is like watching Koreans play battle shows <laughs> I guess I'm saying there's value. No, that's what you're saying. I am saying. And let's leave saying, it at that. I'm saying feminism is, like, now, is a lot like... And now, on the afternoon diner, it's <laughs> o- Ole Pressed Farocco. <laughs> <laughs> to play us out. No, wait, what was the... What was the I could have used more boom boom? <laughs> yeah, I could have used more boom boom, Pressed Farocco. That should be the title of the podcast. Okay. Right. But I, 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 enjoy, I, I really enjoy going to see it with you, and I especially enjoy talking with you about it. Yes. It was fantastic. Even though it was a bit pretentious at times, I still enjoyed doing it. I don't even know, but I don't know how you talk about this. No, I like, agree, I agree. That's the, o- the only other way is we could have been two guys who went, well, the bitch went crazy. <laughs> and then, like, that's the mood. Like, <laughs> but that's not us. That's not you and me, and that's no, not no, what no. we'd want to talk about. And no. there was definitely stuff in there, and it's definitely a far more fascinating movie to talk about than it is to necessarily watch Yeah, okay. as, as two I would, guys. I would go along with it. I think... Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was an interesting movie to, to talk about more than it was to watch as a bloke. But with the caveat, like you say, I suspect if you're a woman, that it would have it would have hit you on some kind of emotional. No, there's level. tons in it that are definitely geared towards it, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the two women in the film didn't have a lot to say about like things they should put in it. Mm. I would be surprised if two guys sat around and made that up. Like, that would be a surprise to me. I would well, it's based on a book. I don't know if a, if a bloke wrote the book. Right. I mean, obviously, and it was written by a man and directed by a man. That much I know. But I don't know about the book. And I don't know about the producers. And I feel like producers very often drive the project. Even if it's no, written but by I, a man. No, no, but I feel like, man, like, I feel producer, like what the man wrote was, well, there's one woman, she moves in with another woman. Uh, spurious reasons. And you're right, and in the filming... Blah, blah, blah. And in the filming, they went, well, let's try and put this in here and let's put that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I would go along with that. Yeah. Right. Thanks, man. And now to play us out. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ole Breast Ferrago. Ole.
And as always, if you enjoy the songs at the end of the show, or if you just like to support the show, you can buy the albums that these songs appear on over at miscplumbingfixtures.bandcamp.com. That's M I S C plumbingfixtures.bandcamp.com. Or look up Miscellaneous Plumbing Fixtures on Spotify and just stream the album because even that gets us 0.1 of a cent or something. Uh, but if you all did that, uh, then it would add up to uh, some money. So that would be wonderful. Please do that and please enjoy this song, Chris Christopherson. Don't hold back, let them all hear what you have to say. Embrace uncertainty each and every day. It can be alright when everything is wrong, except Chris Christopherson. Trumpet sound, your world is coming around. Get dressed up to the night. Let now be your time. You will show them all. You won't be taken for a ride. You can achieve anything you want with the right person by your side. Except Chris Christopherson. 